Here we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dallas Startup Week's keynote event. My name is Christiana Yebra, and I'm the CEO of Vouch, a social matchmaking and dating app launched right here in Dallas, Texas. And just so she doesn't appear out of anywhere, uh, my good friend Alana Stravia <laughs> is here. We are together in a fantastic studio. Yes, we want to give a big uh, shout out and love to Ryan Harper and his Ryan studio Harper. for setting this up for us. And the best part is that we are being socially distant. Can't touch each other, but we can feel the presence. Yes. And that's so that's the thing for you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We know that going virtual doesn't have to mean being less personal. So thank you so much for tuning in. We've got a great event to kick off here. I'm so honored and excited to introduce Bill Chen here in just a second. Um, but before we go into that, I want to tell you a couple of highlights that have already kicked off from this week. Dallas Startup Week, I think this is the sixth year already. One of the first events I ever attended as a startup community member. There are hundreds of sessions across dozens of tracks. We've seen great stories from Peladoc and Jamie O'Banion from Bio, or I'm sorry, it is Beauty Bio. I want to call it Biohack every single time. Um, Jamie O'Banion and great conversations around fundraising, building a brand, and how to get in contact with the right people. So networking, again, from a distance. Um, it is my honor to kick off this event with an introduction to the CEO of the DECK Network. He's just barely, I just congratulate him on an almost one year anniversary here at the DECK, Bill Chin. We had a great conversation about who vouched for him along the way, what helped to make the decision to become the CEO of the DECK. And it sounds like we have a lot of mutual friends. Um, I'm honored to introduce him. He's going to kick off a fantastic event with some globally recognized athletes. We'll get to ask questions involve some of our uh, chats and polls, so make sure you're paying attention to play along. Um, and without further ado, I am excited and honored to introduce Bill Chen. Well, thank you so much, CY. And uh, CY, you're killing it these days. Uh, and CY started, as she said, with the DEC Network. So we're always excited to see what she's up to, and she's, she's really doing a great job these days. So before I introduce our speakers tonight, I wanted to quickly mention that we are participating in North Texas Giving Days, we are a nonprofit, and early giving started today. And the first time ever, we've got a match, which means that every dollar you give will be doubled, right? It's like a two-for-one sale. So every dollar you give will be doubled in that match, and it will go to support uh, minority businesses in the southern sector of our city. Um, now, we posted that link, and I think to the side of me in the chat, there's that link. You can click on it. Uh, but we appreciate your support and consideration. So it feels like we're in a virtual world these days. Uh, it feels like it's getting permanent, and I can tell you why. I know it's getting permanent, because we made signs, right? So we built this sign up here. This comes up a lot, right? Mute your button, uh, and then you flip it over, and it says, sorry about my job, my dog, my cat, my spouse, my far alarm. Don't use the spouse. That doesn't go down. All right, we've got a big lineup tonight, uh, an amazing all-pro safety from the Dallas Cowboys and current entrepreneur Darren Woodson. After Darren speaks, he's going to do a Q&A, so please be ready for that. Uh, and then additionally, a little bit later tonight, we have five-time Olympic medalist Nastia Lukin, who is also a current entrepreneur. Nastia has recently moved back to the DFW area. We're so excited to get her back where she belongs. Welcome back, Nastia. Glad to have you here. Uh, but before I bring on Nastia, let me talk a little bit how I met this last speaker. So several years ago, we're doing a fundraiser. It's big house in Island Park. And I'm speaking, so I arrive early. I knock on the door of this mansion, and uh, Darren Woodson opens the door. And the first thing he says to me, I don't say hello, he doesn't say hi, he goes, is this your house? I'm like, uh, Darren, you open the door. And then he goes, look, I just got here. The door is open, so I walked in, and then you knocked. So the way I met my football hero was we'll walk around his mansion trying to find the owner of this house. So it's kind of a fun way to meet your hero. Uh, but we all know Darren really well. He played for the Cowboys. We all know it's an absolute travesty that he's not in the Hall of Fame yet. Uh, but after an amazing football career, he went on to join ESRP Real Estate. He's been an entrepreneur. He's been in corporate America. He's been successful every place he's been. But the thing we love about Darren, he's made significant contributions to his community. He's actively involved with Make-A-Wish Foundation, United Way, C5 Foundation, and now the Debt Network. Um, so we really appreciate Darren and his support of our community. Please join me in welcoming Darren Woodson to our virtual stage. Bill, I hear the claps. Bill, oh, yeah. thank you for the introduction. Uh, look, I want to go back to my story. I need to tell a story. And going back to January 
1993. And in that moment, I'm playing in the Super Bowl in Pasadena, California. And it starts in a locker room, in a locker room that I've, I've never been in. I'm sitting in this locker room on a stool and I'm getting ready to go out. At 21 years old, I'm getting ready to go out and play the biggest game of my life. The dream come true. 21 years old, I always wanted to play in the Super Bowl. I always wanted to be a professional, athlete, a professional football player. And here I am, my dream, sitting in the locker room, getting ready. And in that time, I'm with 52 other men who are about to walk out on that football field. And it's their dream as well. And across the way, across the hall, there's another locker room with 53 men with the Buffalo Bills, and they're getting ready to do and play this game. And I'm sitting there in this locker room at 21, and I'm thinking about my life. Not about the game, but I'm starting to think about my life. Because you, as you can imagine, there's so much anxiety, there's so much nervousness. There's, a, there's 50 million people who are about to tune in and watch that game my family, my friends, everyone. It's the focal point, it's the Super Bowl. And my nerves are shot, but I'm thinking about where I come from. Not about the game, but where I come from. And let me tell you where I come from. I come from Henson Projects in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where I was raised. Came up as a kid, my mother raised four kids, single parent household, raised four kids, work two jobs and this is going through my mind while i'm sitting there in that locker room and i'm thinking at seven years old i told my mother that i would be here this day playing in the super bowl I told everybody around me that i was going to be a professional football player I didn't tell them it was going to be the dallas cowboys but i told them i was going to be a professional football player and the person in my life my mother who again raised four kids worked two jobs sacrificed for herself to provide for her family. No father figure, just my mother. And the thoughts that were going through my mind were, how does she get to that? I'm locker room thinking about how she accomplished that. What was her goal in life? Well, I can tell you what her, what her goals were. Her goal was to be compelled, and she used to always tell us, I'm not about just being content in life. I'm not just about being committed in life. I'm not just about being compliant. He says, I want to be compelled and I want to give and serve and serve you and serve others at the same aspect. So I'm gonna take you back to that locker room. I'm back in the locker room. And my mind is going through, okay, what do I need to take place? So I'm thinking about the family. I'm thinking about my friends. I'm thinking about everything else. And then I push it to the side and I say, hey, this is my moment to be compelled. This is my moment of greatness right now. So here comes the anxiety, as you can imagine. And I'm starting to think about what do I need to do individually today to make an impact for my team? What do I need to become? And I said, you know, I started thinking about it and I said, look, the only thing you can do is do what they taught you to do. And that's to do your job, do your job. So again, sitting in a locker room, and I gotta paint this picture of this locker room. You know, everybody hears about the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, and they always say, well, it's beautiful, and you know, the, the, the grass is green, and it's 75 degrees and whatnot. And yeah, that's true when you're outside on the grass, but when you're in a locker room in 1993, it's a dingy place. It's a lonely place. There's 53 other men in this locker room the stalls, the bathroom stalls. And I'm gonna paint this picture for the for the ladies out there. I'm gonna paint you this picture. It's not a pretty picture, but the stalls are inside the locker room. They're not around the corner. They're not. There's not a bathroom around the corner. The stalls are actually sitting in the locker room. And you're talking all these men who are nervous and these big offensive linemen that are 340 pounds who are nervous as well. And there's three commodes and there and you can hear everything in that commode and, <laughs> and the smell wasn't good but I, <laughs> it wasn't a lovely place to be in 
But you knew the one thing that we all had, we had one thing in common, that was to win this football game. So I'm thinking in my mind at 21, I'm talking to older veteran players who were in their 30s, and I'm talking to them about, hey, the, the situation, what do we got to do today to win this game? Here's what I, I – the communication, we're communicating in the locker room about what could take place on the field. What are the adjustments we're going to make? You know, what are our hand signals if the crowd noise is too loud? There's so many things that you're going through in that moment. And I'm doing that with them. I'm going over our hand signals. I'm going over my fits and exactly where I need to be at, at every moment, my responsibilities, their responsibilities and all. And then you hear this knock on the door. And it's the same knock I've been hearing for 17 games or 20 some games that season through the regular season and then to the playoffs and then to the Super Bowl. And it's a knock. And it's usually a referee. He walks in and it's boom. He hits the door and he says, two minutes. And that means you got two minutes to put your helmets on, put your short pass, and it's about time to walk out to the field. And it's in that, and that moment is when everything starts to come to fruition that you're actually about to walk out there. So that two minute Boom, the, the referee hits the door, and then here comes Jimmy Johnson, our head coach. He walks up, and he stands in, in, front of the, in, in the middle of the room in front of 53 other men, and, we're sitting, and he's sitting there talking to us, and he says, look, I'm not going to give you a raw, raw speech. I'm going to tell you to do your job and do exactly what you've been doing and how you've prepared. This is the day you've prepared to the fullest, and you're ready to play this game. So let's go out and win. Now, you would think that, you know, you see all these stories, see all these movies and all, you think you get the Newt Rockney speech and he's going to preach to us for three or four or five minutes and tell us his long story. No, that was it. Do your job. We've been here before. We're a disciplined football team. Let's go out and win that game. That's it. I mean, he walks out. He walks out of the room and then everyone walks into what is called the tunnel. And in here in the tunnel, things change. It's totally different from the anxiety that I've been feeling in the locker room, the anxiousness that I've had, the nervousness, that's gone. You get in the tunnel with all your players. And as you can see, you're walking down a tunnel. I want you to picture this walking down a tunnel and all you can see is the grass. And you can hear the fans, the cheering, the crowds, everything's going on. And it's that time when you're surrounded by your teammates to where all the anxiety is gone. The fear is out. You played that game in the locker room. You had the fear, the nervousness, that's all gone. And you sit there and you look at the, your teammates, the guys that, who, who would battle with you since March in the off-season program, working out together, running together, getting in shape, doing all the little things that it takes to, to get to this moment. You're sitting there, you're looking in the eyes, and I'm looking in the eyes of Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin and Troy Aiken, and, and you know, the list goes on and on. And all the doubt that I had when I was in the locker room is gone because I know the preparation is there. I know the dogs that are in that locker, in that, in that tunnel, those 53 men are ready to hunt, ready to go. There is no more tomorrow. It's about today. It's about this game and am I ready? And that's when the nerves go out because I know I'm prepared. I'm fully, fully prepared for this moment. Both physically and mentally, there are nothing. I don't have any other checks to go through. It's over with. This, this, it's game time. And it's in that moment when you're walking down that tunnel that you never, ever, and I know uh, Nastia is going to talk to you here shortly after I get done talking, but it's in that moment where you never get that feeling back. There's nothing I can do in, 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 in corporate America that can get that feeling back from the ultimate team, ultimate game, pressures on the line, and you have this overwhelming confidence in self. Overwhelming confidence, because you know you've done all the little things. And you get down to the bottom where the grass is and they, bro they rope you off. They don't let you just run out, they rope you off and you're still sitting there with your men for another two minutes. 
and you're hugging each other and you know half of us you know the emotions are so high tears are coming out your eyes because this is your dream this is the moment and then they finally let that rope go and they run out and you run out and then you see the crowd and that's the moment of joy that's when it's like hey this is it's time to play this game it's super bowl sunday yeah my mom's watching me my family my friends my buddies everybody's watching me now it's time to show the skill set and those were the greatest moments that i've had that's one of some of the greatest moments and i i did this three times as far as super bowls are concerned but it's that moment that i remember reminded me that to reflect on what I've accomplished in my life, the ups and downs in my life, and how I overcame those things. And how did I overcome those things? Through discipline, straight discipline. Like getting up in the morning at five o'clock when no one wants to get up, going to the gym, making sure I'm prepared. I'm staying extra time after practice to make sure I got enough film work. Not sleeping at night, sometimes staying up to one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning to make sure I got my assignments done. That's the pre preparation. So Super Bowl Sunday, I'm gonna give you a little bit of taste. So those that are too young or didn't experience Super Bowl 27, uh, shame on you. But at the same time, we're going to win that game 52 to 17. And one of the greatest experiences of my life. But it paved the way, that experience, and what I went through in the locker room and, and, and reflecting has paved the way for the rest of my life because every, there's been times in my life, whether it be in commercial real estate, whether it be when I founded uh, Counterfine, which is a, uh, a platform that eliminates uh, uh, eliminates uh, counterfeit merchandise. As being a founder, there's certain things that you have to go through. As an entrepreneur, there's certain things and moments you have to go through in your life. And when I started up the counterfine three years ago, some of those same moments came back to where I had to reflect on where am I coming from? Where, you know, the beginning of where I've been and, and what I want to accomplish in my life. And it was the same thing. It was the same thought process of I got to grind. I have to grind this out. And nobody is going to love me like I love me. And nobody's going to wake me up and try to push me to the next level, especially in the corporate world. You you kill what you eat. And, and the discipline that I learned from football just naturally carried over. There was no being content and just being happy to have a job. I just didn't feel like, like I felt I was I fit in that mold. And being content is the same thing that there's a lot of people that go through this. And they're, it's okay. I mean, it's, everybody has their own way of life. But I felt like I never wanted to just be happy with just average and mediocrity. That wasn't a part of who I was. That wasn't a part of who my mother made my mother who she was. Nor did I expect to be content when I played in the NFL. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about the NFL and my experience with the NFL that has really applied to me. In, as, as an entrepreneur. You see, in the NFL, every game, there's hundreds of thousands of fans who are watching those games. And those fans are your fans and then there are other fans, but you're, criti you're criticized by every little thing that you do, every mistake that you make. There's either a reporter, a, a Monday morning quarterback, who's critiquing you, your family, your friends, everyone's critiquing you because you're on TV. And every Monday, you can play, I can play a game on Sunday, but on Monday, not only are the fans gonna critique me Sunday night and Monday and the rest of the week, but my own team, my own peers are gonna critique my game as well. So Monday morning, I wake up after a Sunday game, I have to go back and watch film of the performance I had the day before. And all of us do, all 53 men, every team. Every Monday, you are criticized by your coaches, self-criticized, you put all this onus on everything, that, that all the mistakes that you made. 
And then you and then you move on to the next week. And then it's over with. Tuesday morning, you wake up, it's over with. You don't even think about what happened in the past. You move on to the next week. Well, that's the same thing that happens in business. And that's the reason why there's so many athletes who not who you'll talk to Nastia here in a minute, who are, over, are are willing to overcome some of the downs and the, and the downs that they had in their loss because they've been criticized all their life. I've been criticized since day one since I've Walked into high school, played high school ball my freshman year in high school. It's natural to be, crit be criticized. And to be honest with you, I don't give a damn what other people think about how I go about my business as long as I'm focused and have the mindset. So let me take you back to Counterfine. When I started Counterfine, I knew there was going to be some criticism. I knew there was going to be some doubt, not only in myself, but in my team on is this football player going to be able to transition from the football world over to the software uh, world and have a, and run a SaaS company. There was gonna be some criticism, but I was willing, absolutely willing to run through that fire. When I got recruited over to ESRP, commercial real estate, I knew that there was gonna be some naysayers to say that I can make the transition into corporate real estate and own basically be a partner in one and own another business. There's gonna be a lot of criticism. There's gonna be a lot of doubters that say, hey, just dribble, like someone said a long time ago, just stick to what you do as a football player and as a pro athlete. Don't don't get into business and don't talk about this and that. No, no, no. I always felt like there was always a part of me that was willing, very much willing to run through that fire and deal with the criticism both on and off the field. And I think that's what made has made me the person I am in, as an entrepreneur is knowing and setting goals to understand who I want to be. So one, I will not be content. I'm going to throw this out at you. I call it my four C's. I will never be content on the, in any situation that we're in in my business life. I don't want to be comfortable in any situation. Two. I won't be compliant. And compliant meaning we're just average. We're just whole hum. It's okay to just be aligned as like everyone else and just be compliant through the whole situation. I don't want to be just compliant. Three, I don't want to be committed. And I know people always say, well, you need to be committed. Yeah, there's being committed is one thing. But being committed can be very, very selfish at the same time. It's like I'm focused on being committed for self. I want to be commit beyond committed. There's something to say about that person that has that that streak in them. Sometimes it's, you know, that somebody, I always say it's that dog. You have that dog in you that wants more. It just wants so much more. Not for yourself, but for others as well. And I went back and I told you guys about my mom being compelled. And that's where I want to be. I want to be compelled. The alarm does not wake me up in the morning. I wake myself up in the morning. I'm an entrepreneur. The alarm is not waking me up. I'm waking myself up. There's a love and a purpose for what I want to get accomplished, period. And every day I have to keep score. And I know a lot of people will have these things of don't, don't keep score, don't do this. No, no, I, I'm an athlete. I have to keep score. And however you get there, you figure out how to get there. But I find a way to keep score that keeps me on track on what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. So for all those entrepreneurs who are sitting here today, probably listening in, you know, all the naysayers and the doubters and the family members who said you can't do it, damn that. You can do it. You can do it. It's on you. It's all about your own work ethic. Don't rely on everybody else. Rely on self and keep pushing through. And that's where I am today. I have not conquered the world. I, I, trust me, I have not. But damn it, I'm gonna push it. I'm gonna push the envelope. I'm gonna make sure that, that people know I'm standing here and I'm gonna use my resources, which, you know, I have plenty of good resources and starting with the, the Cowboys, but I'm gonna use all those resources and do exactly what I need to do. So again, don't be content. Don't be compliant. If you're okay just being committed, eh, be compelled. Be compelled and know that it's on you to get the job done. So I want to tell, before I get done, I want to tell a story. So I want to open it up for Q&A here in a second. But 
I want to tell a quick story. So I mentioned that the alarm clock doesn't wake me up. So every day I go through this battle with myself every morning. See, I'm, a, I'm an early riser. I'm a workout guy. I have to work out every morning, whether it be some cardio for 30 minutes or in the weight room, whatever. I have to get a workout every morning, even on Sunday mornings. I got to go do something. So here's how I personally overcome it. Every morning I get up out of bed, it's about five, about 5.13, 5.14. It's like clockwork. No alarm, I just roll up out of bed. And every morning I go to the sink and I wash my face and I look at the coward that's in the, the mirror, that coward being me. I look at that coward every single day and I go through this, the same steps because I know I have to accomplish wins throughout the day. Here I go keeping score again, right? So here are my wins. If I can get in the gym, that's a win. That's one win for the day. So I have to do things like this. I have to walk, look at myself and wash my face. And I have to, it's a little tricky now, I got to put my shoes on. The first thing I have to do, no underwear, no shorts, no not shoes. I have to put my shoes on because I have to fool the coward to not get back in the bed. Period. I know I'm not gonna get back in the bed with my shoes on. So I put my shoes on. Then yeah, I get my shorts on, brush the teeth and all that. And the first thing I do, I got a little gym that I go to in the mornings. I get in that gym. Actually, I'll tell you this, before I even go to the gym, I have to call my buddy because I have to have an accountability partner that, that's gonna push me through the process. So every morning, about 5.30, I'm texting him, he's texting me, making sure we're getting there together. I got to have someone push me through the weights because I can easily go into the gym and shut it down. Because one thing I know about myself and the coward that I am, I'll walk in that gym and I'll have a workout sheet and I'll half-ass it, excuse my language. I'll do half the work. But if I have someone hold my hand through the process and, and pushing me and I'm pushing them, I'll get the workout done. That's one. I'll come back in. I always look at it this way. That's my win. That's my first win for the day. I get stuff done and go get showered. And then making it to the office is another win. Just making it in the office is a win for me. Because it <laughs> What's the coward want to do? The coward wants to not work. So don't want to face up to things. You may have some losses that you had to go through the night before or whatnot, but you got to face those things. You got to face the critics or whatnot. And the coward does not want to face those, those obstacles. So I got to overcome that. So just getting in the office is a W for me. And it goes this way every single day of my life. You see, I have to defeat self first. I have to do, I have to win against self because self wants to quit. And it's those of us that are out there that are young entrepreneurs who understand where I'm coming from. Because you will talk yourself out of greatness. Just flat out talk yourself out of greatness. Understand that you're going to look at the coward in the mirror and overcome him. And then you're going to have to find accountability partners who are going to hold your feet to the fire. Thank God I got a beautiful wife that works out harder than I do and is tougher, tough as nails. But I wanted to leave you guys with that today. Just know who you are. Know your weaknesses. Surround yourself with people that can cover up those weaknesses and who can be real with you and help you in those in the, through the process. But don't act like you can do this alone because I can tell you this, I've won three Super Bowls. I've got four beautiful children. I've uh, accomplished a lot in my life and I have not done one thing by myself. It's always been someone else pulling me up through the process. So uh, I may have went over too long, I'm not sure. And I apologize if I did, but I wanna open it up for questions if that's okay. 
Darren, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, keynote address. We are opening it up for questions. So if anybody has a question for Darren, make sure to join in on the chat. You were literally right on on the dot, one minute over time. So well, well, done. Done. <laughs> well done. So don't apologize. You were right on track. Uh, we'll wait for some questions to come in. I have my first question, though, if you don't mind. Um, I've been watching your Brolympics um, on Instagram, and I'm wondering if there's any requirements, height requirements, weight requirements. You told me to know my weaknesses, and my weaknesses are lifting heavy things. So I'm just wondering if there's a <laughs> opportunity for me to participate in the Bro Olympics. Uh, well, look, the Bro Olympics are. I started a podcast with myself and a guy named a former cowboy named Tyler Clutson, uh, former athlete, uh, college athlete named Ben Gibbs. Uh, we're all work at uh, ESRP, my commercial real estate firm, and uh, we started a podcast about four months ago. And we are a bunch of knuckleheads, <laughs> bunch of dudes, real dudes that, uh, you know, we wanted to get involved with a podcast to, to, to hear stories because there's so many, so many people that have stories. Like I'll give you an example, Troy Aikman came on the show and we basically peel back the onion of who Troy is, not just the athlete, but his personal stories and how he's overcome so many things and how many the losses that he's, he's had more losses than he's had wins in his life. And how did he overcome those? So we want to tell, we want to go all the way back and tell the story. So the Bro Olympics are some of the things that we do, the athletic things, whether it be the, the cardio test uh, battles against each other or kicking field goals, which we just did the other day. Uh, we're a couple, we're about, we're three idiots that uh, have fun <laughs> being idiots. Hey, but you bring on smart people to the show. I saw the the BK and her name's escaping me from Whoop. I thought that was really fascinating. They've blown up so all of their performance metrics and um, how they're catering to I don't want to say civilians, but non athletes like myself, <laughs> yeah. the, the civilians, um, to to feel like they've got you know an idea of how their body's performing on and off the metaphorical field and recovery, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, too. yeah, I, I'm, I'm wearing my Whoop right now. Listen, okay, I, I think a lot of what we talk about is on the podcast and you know our little niche is mental and physical performance you know it, it's one thing to be physically fit and push yourself every single day but mentally is where your strength is that's where you know if you have the mental capabilities to overcome some things that's 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 the part of it that you know i want to stay hyper focused in because there's a lot of us again myself i played sports and i get it you know i was physically fit to play the, in the nfl but that's a small window of time a very small slither of time. I need to use my brain and strengthen my brain at the same time and be mentally fit. That's uh, that's going to carry me through. So uh, that's our that's been our focus with our podcast. Hey, Darren, we're going to take a question here. This is from Diana Decker. She says, "How did you decide to go into the software business?" Uh, actually, I fell into it. Actually, I mean, I just this is being honest. I, I was with a a group that uh, was doing print on demand shirts. I was mentoring a group as an investor for a group that was doing print on demand and saw there was a need out there for a company that could eliminate the counterfeit merchandise that was out there. Imagine the Dallas Cowboys selling their gear and you have uh, someone from another country that's basically, or in, their, in, in the States that's knocking off uh, their gear. You know, it happens on Amazon all the time. So I just felt like there was a niche market there that we could take, I could take advantage of, and Counterfine was exactly the company. We started up the company. Uh, we have a ton of you know, Universal Records, the Dallas Cowboys, a lot of big, uh, uh, both sports and entertainment groups that have uh, signed up with us, and, and things have gone extremely well. But again, it's just about the work ethic. We put the work, at, we put the time in uh, to get where we are right now. Uh, let's take another one from Paul Williams. He says, I'd like Darren to speak about what types of tech talents are needed here in DFW or at his company. Uh, my company, we're always looking at software developers. Always. I mean, there is a huge need for, for, for software developers, in, 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 uh, especially with a SaaS company. And we're looking for you know, those that are innovative and, and, and are uh, hyper-focused on, you know, I, listen, here's the way that I look at software, anyone that's working for us right now in the software world. I want them to eventually own their own companies. That's the mindset I want. I want someone to come in. Yes, you're working for Counterfine, but at the same time, I want you to have the dream and the scope to understand that I'm going through this. This is just a step to what they want to do. And, and there's a lot of software developers out there 
um, that you can see it's a different mindset. These, uh, I said these young kids, because I'm an old man now, but these young kids are, are motivated and, and I'm still happy to be a part of that. Let's see, uh, I do believe we have another question. Let's see, did you maybe want to ask Christiana? Uh, I'm having to scroll through, so give me just one moment oh, yeah, here. Okay. The virtual world we're living in. <laughs> well, I will say that Chloe C. let uh, let everyone know that she she met you back in the day and you gave a very lovely hug. I thought that was oh. really sweet. <laughs> hey, people, people skills first. We talk about this all the time in business. Um, you know, be a pleasure to be around, be a joy to work with. Um, and so thank you for being a kind uh, entrepreneur and somebody that they can, you know, be approachable with. Socially distanced, of course. <laughs> now, Derek, yes, I am nowhere close to a public figure like you by any means, but in my small little way, I've learned that people will always remember the way you make them feel, always. not always with what you said. So I think that's really important. Of course, it's, it's all about first impressions. I found the question and it is from Carolyn Nash. Mm -hmm. Carolyn says, have you ever had a tunnel moment in your business? What was that moment and what was the outcome? Oh man, Carolyn, that's a great, that is a great question. Uh, have I had the tunnel moment? Uh, yeah, uh, no, no, I, I would say this. I've been close to having that tunnel moment. That tunnel moment for me was, you know, having, you know, having so much anxiety about walking out, but good anxiety about walking out. Like, like, like I, you know, described when I was walking through the tunnel, it's just the feeling of being around, you know, people with the, your teammates that have that same goal. Uh, at ESRP, my commercial real estate firm, we work as teams. And, and in that process, it, it gives me the feel that I'm back in the locker room. And we've won a few big deals over the last two year and a half. I would say about the last year and a half that have come really close because, you know, it, you know, for me, it's like when, when we win, I'm so happy for my teammates. I mean, I want you know, the joy really comes in when I see my teammates. win. That's the joy for myself. Yeah, that's one thing. But to put a smile on your people that are working for you, who, you know, are feeding their families and, you know, they have hopes and dreams as well. And you can provide for them. That is the ultimate joy. So that's the tunnel vision that I've the tunnel that I've experienced. All right, let's see, we have some more questions. Let's see how many we can fit in. Uh, let's see, stand by, stand by, stand by. Cassandra says, is it difficult to start a podcast? Uh, yes and no. Look, I, I'll say this. If it was by myself, there's no way I'd do a podcast. I'd be done. I would, I, honestly, I would be done. I don't have what the creativeness, one, my mind doesn't work that way. So what I've done is surrounded myself with those Ben Gibbs, Tyler Klutz, who are creative in a sense and who hold me accountable. They make sure that I'm calling the guests. They make sure that I'm going to show up and be on time. And the last thing I want to do is disappoint those two because, well, one is 6'4", 260, and the other one is about 6'3", 250. So they're much bigger than that. I am. Okay. So there's some fear. There's some fear involved in this at the same time. But in doing so, look, it's not that hard, but you just have to start a podcast. You just have to be consistent. It has to be every single day, whether it be topics, knowing who your guests are going to be, uh, making sure that the equipment, the right, that you buy the right equipment. It's just doing your research. And YouTube is, let me tell you this. We were YouTubers when we started this. We just figured it out via YouTube. I find, I think, life through YouTube. Like, yeah. so, I'm an adult. YouTube search. <laughs> yeah, it helps. What would we do without it? <laughs> it helps. Yo, the questions are coming in. I really appreciate it. Are you seeing those also? Uh, yep. Let's you see. Want me to jump into it? Yeah, go for it. Uh, speaking of Google, um, Siva said today on NPR, he heard that commercial real estate owners are not super happy with companies like Google announcing remote work until mid 2021, mm -hmm. saying it's going to start some sort of snowball effect. What? How has, has the pandemic affected you in that way? Or what Absolutely. are your thoughts about that? Absolutely, and totally get where that question is coming from. Who was that to ask, to ask the question? Siva. Siva asked. See, yeah, I'll tell you what, that is a phenomenal question. Uh, yes, I think here's, the, here's the, the ticker. I'm in a tenant rep business. So basically, we're helping uh, businesses find office space or industrial space. And, and to hear what Google has said is basically working from home uh, <laughs> through the next couple of years and having a mindset 
you know, that directly affects our business. And, you know, for me, it's, you know, it, it's one thing to make those statements, but that doesn't apply to every company because there's a lot of companies out there who are built on culture. They need to see each other within the workplace. Uh, they need to, to be creative in the sense that they, you're walking down the hallway and you bump into somebody with the office and there's some creativeness going back and forth. And there's some talk, some dialogue. You don't get that when you're at home. Virtually, you just don't get that when you're, I, I'm sitting here right now and this interview would be totally different if I was standing there in person with you two. It would be totally different. And that's sort of the same feel that you have in the office. So being at home, you know, depending on the business, I'm seeing, and I'm, I get it. I understand there's going to be some businesses that you or some employees that can not work from home. But if you want to have true culture, I think there's got to be some of that. Let's get back to what we used to be uh, before COVID. Hey, Darren, just bear with us a second. The lights went out at the studio that those guys are at. So I think lightning hit them. Um, Man, so it is storming out here, Bill, like bad. All right. So I think, um, so Darren, thank you. That was awesome. Um, wow. Great insight. Um, it's weird. Think, Go ahead. So, so I think we might jump to Nastia, and I'm okay. doing a poor job of, of kind of mediating. But Darren, thank you again. You're awesome. Wait, I think we just got him back. Did we get him back? Well, you just tell me, Ben, when you guys are ready. We're good. Either right, way. Right now, right Darren. Yeah, I think we're good. Darren, you've been awesome. I appreciate it. You can sign off. Um, we're going to send you a gift uh, in appreciation. But hopefully we're going to stay in touch with you, Darren. And next I time, uh, you want around a mansion, uh, just give me a shout. Out. <laughs> okay. Hey, Bill, I want to listen to Nastia. How do I do that? Oh, okay, so what you do is you just hit your uh, um, silence and then hit the. It looks like a little movie camera. I'll take. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. You got it. All right, great. All right, great. Bro. Thanks for it. Um, okay, sorry for for the interruption here, guys. Um, it's it's too bad we're gonna miss the ladies. Uh, but I'm gonna introduce Nastia. As you've heard, Nastia is an amazing uh, athlete, incredible, uh, and then also has become a really successful entrepreneur. Uh, most importantly, she's moved back where she belongs. She's back here in Dallas, Texas, and that was very recent. That's over the last couple of weeks, uh, so we're very excited to get her. Uh, and without further ado, I'll introduce Nastia Lukic. Hi. <laughs> um, first of all, yeah, it's storming really bad here, so hopefully um, – I'll have better luck, I guess, <laughs> um, with my connection. And hopefully the lights don't go out here. Um, I know this part of um, the keynote was kind of going to be a conversation. So, Nastia, uh, can you hear me by chance? It's I a can hear you, yes. Hey, you won't be alone now. <laughs> but oh, kind you, of. You, you're back. There's lights. <laughs> We're working on it. We're troubleshooting right now. We believe it's the weather. Um, so, storm. Right. Um, so thank you for, I'm so sorry, Darren. We just let Darren go and handle it himself. So thank you, Bill, for jumping in. Nastia, thank you so much uh, for being ready to get up and running on your own. Yeah, I was just um, going to like start talking, but you guys are back. So Yeah, no, don't, hey, you know what? It, just like Darren said, it's always better to do things with a team. So even though you can't see me quite yet, it's you can... Easy. Can, can you? You can't see oh, us. Yeah, I see oh, you guys. Okay, okay, great. Now we're okay. back. Okay, Ooh. Nastia, you're not alone now. Not alone. We are together in spirit. Hopefully yeah, the weather sorry. is okay outside. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Great. There we go. All right, oh, we're back okay. and running. Thank you, everybody, uh, Thanks, guys. For, for bearing with That's us. Well, outside. we're going to we're gonna rewind for a second. We're gonna thank Darren. We're gonna thank Phil for jumping in for us. And we're gonna launch this next part, which we're very excited about. Nastia Lukin, thank you for joining us. I first wanna introduce who's going to be moderating the conversation with you and keeping the conversation going. Miss Alana Sarabia, Good Morning Texas host and producer and a good friend of mine um, and a great friend of a community uh, here in Dallas and the ultimate storyteller. So I'm so excited to introduce her <laughs> and have her kick off this next part of the event. Hopefully we don't have a power outage again. And if we do, we'll, we'll figure it out. 
Yeah, we'll figure it out. Thank you for that, by the way. And Nasty and I, we're actually old friends. We've already done this before on Good Morning Texas. Well, there you go. Yeah, so Nasty, we're going to do it all over again. And actually, whenever we spoke on Good Morning Texas, bless your heart, you were having issues with your oh lighting. Oh, my God. I did. I got new lighting in here. So it's like this must Look be a thing it. between us. It's just like, a, yeah. But I'm ready to go if you guys too somehow... Much energy. Yeah, I don't know. Too much energy, but yeah, we're good to go now. A lot of people, they don't want to hear us talk. They want to hear your story and what you have to say. And so for those um, who, of course, we know you as, I actually, I remember growing up watching you at the Olympics, you know, so getting to talk to you truly is, even a second time around, is such a treat. But tell me, you know, some people might not know that you're an entrepreneur because they know you as an Olympian. So tell us about that tr transition from athlete to now entrepreneur. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, so both of my parents were actually gymnasts and we moved, um, I was born in Russia and we moved to the Dallas area when I was about three years old. And so, you know, growing up, I'm the only child. So growing up, um, my parents, they were, um, you know, world Olympic champions in gymnastics, but they always had a dream and a goal to one day open up their gymnastics school. Um, and that's where they did it. They have done it here in the Dallas area, one in Plano, one in Frisco. And, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really realize how hard it is what they were doing. First of all, moving to a country where they didn't even speak the language um, yeah. and they didn't know anybody here, didn't have friends, family, um, had a baby <laughs> and a dream. And I feel like just being able to kind of grow up, um, like living that with them kind of helped me as I got older the more I realized like how hard that actually is, what they did, the more it inspired me. Um, and kind of made me realize like, okay, if they were able to do this, then, you know, I can do whatever it is that my goals are. And obviously that first goal being, you know, competing at the Olympics and, and winning an Olympic gold medal and um, being able to achieve that was, was obviously um, a lifelong dream at 18. So it was like very surreal because, for 18 years, that was kind of the only thing that I really ever wanted to like achieve. It was something that I want to, you know, going to sleep every night. That's all I like had dreams about was standing on that podium, winning an Olympic gold medal. And then when it actually happened, it was, don't get me wrong, the most amazing experience of my life, like standing there with a gold medal around my neck, you know, seeing the American flag being raised, listening to the national anthem, but at the same time, having these feelings like of fear, thinking, now what? You know, I had just achieved my quote unquote lifelong dream at 18 years old, and now I have the rest of my life to live. And A, I didn't have any other goals right in that moment. B, I had no idea who I was. You know, gymnastics and in my sport defined who I was for when I ended up retiring, I was 22. So for 22 years, I was like, I'm just Nasty Luke in the gymnast. I didn't know who just Nasty was. And it was really scary because even though, you know, I, I retired on you know, my, it was my own decision, but I did feel like something was kind of being taken away from me because it was my identity. So um, that's when I left Dallas and I went to NYU. So I moved to New York City. Again, didn't know anybody. I had been there multiple times for work. So I knew a little bit of the city, but... Um, hadn't been in school in almost seven years. So it was just like throwing myself into another challenge. Um, four years later, graduated. And that's kind of like while I was there, I guess like I started that transition of kind of figuring out and it's really trying to figure out like, what are my passions? And I think that's the most important thing is to figure out what are your passions? Not necessarily like, what's my huge goal? What is it that I want to achieve or accomplish? That you have to start small. You know, you have to kind of, go back and think, for me, it was so easy for 22 years, gymnastics is my passion. So I knew that I loved that. So then now moving on to what your goals are. And so I had to completely start from scratch, really. And I think transitions, it, no matter what you're going through, are extremely difficult in life, whether, you know, it's retiring from a sport, like Darren and I both had to do, um, and starting this next chapter of our, of our lives, or graduating college and getting your first job or starting your first company. Like it is so scary, you know? And I think that being an athlete kind of helped that transition for me because yes, I was nervous at the Olympics. Yes, there, you know, there was some fear. Yes, there was uncertainty, 
all those things, but I had already experienced that at such a, like, like this level that was like on such a huge scale that then this transition, it was like the unknown, but at the same time, I kind of was able to like, I guess have a little bit more confidence knowing that, you know, going to Olympics, I was not guaranteed an Olympic medal, right? So now this moving on to this transition was kind of like, even if you don't really know what you wanna do right in this moment, take a step back and figure out what is your passion and like, what's your mission? What, it, like deep down, what is it that you want to accomplish and achieve? So I feel like that was kind of like the beginning of my transition and, and being in New York City and, and going to school and when you like for four years, that kind of like allowed me to start figuring that out. And you know, what a place to learn all of this about yourself in New York City. I mean, what a <laughs> dream. Now, that the transition was, uh, it was a journey for you is definitely what it sounds like. But for those, we know you're an entrepreneur, but what is it you do? Yeah. So, I mean, every day is very different for me. So, you know, unlike some entrepreneurs or um, business owners, like I don't go into um, an office every single day with or without this pandemic. Um, normally, while when times were a little bit different, um, I was pretty much traveling every single week, multiple cities um, all over the place. So um, right after I graduated or right after I retired, I guess I started commentating for NBC. Um, so was just supposed to be in Tokyo for the Olympics. Obviously, fingers crossed that happens next year. <laughs> um, so I do that. I do a lot of um, camps and clinics, normally camps and clinics in the summer. Um, but my biggest passion has been um, starting my own company and currently going through a little bit of a rebrand. Um, and so the new, with the new rebrand, the company is called the Muse Collective. Um, but previously it was called Grander. And I think, you know, while being in New York and after I retired, I kind of just realized that my greatest passion was truly trying to help um, inspire, educate, um, and connect with the next generation. And for me, I was so lucky to have so many incredible mentors throughout my entire career, a lot of them within the gymnastics space and the gymnastics community. And and I, I kind of realized like that I was very lucky because my so many of my idols were my parents' friends, <laughs> which I know that's not very normal, but I think I realized the access that I had was very unusual. So, you know, yes, we live in a world with social media and, and all of those things, and that's great. It's a great, I have a love-hate relationship with it, but it's a great place to sometimes be able to connect with people. Now, I don't always see, you know, the messages that people send me every single day. And so I was thinking, and then, you know, doing in-person events, you have 0.2 seconds to try to like connect with someone and talk to someone and I just felt like everybody, you know, these young girls or anybody was leaving wanting more. And so basically we created this um, community uh, to really just try to inspire the next generation to be the best version of themselves. And it's not necessarily about becoming an Olympic gold medalist. Like that's not, I guess I had dreams about that as a little girl, but that wasn't, you know, this I didn't ever feel like I would never be fulfilled if I didn't achieve that. And my parents, that was so important to them. They always wanted to make sure that I was a, I was a good person and not necessarily a great gymnast. Like the great gymnast mm -hmm. always is just like a cherry on the top. If you, you know, work hard and you know, you you achieve your dreams, that's great. But for them, it was always um, about having a good heart. And so you know, in, in learning and in the journey and all of that. And so um, throughout the company, like that's kind of just, that's our mission and that's our goal. And, and to be able to connect, you know, this next generation to um, people within whatever industry that they want to be successful in. So yeah, it's been exciting just being able to, especially in a time like this, um, mm -hmm. not being able to do in-person events. So um, we're really looking forward to hopefully having some virtual events in the near future, but um, and then the near, near future, having more in-person events as well. Nasty, here's your one tip. Try to avoid doing virtual events on a thunderstorm day. Okay. I know. I'm like literally just sitting here, like crossing my fingers because it just keeps getting like worse and worse. Darker and darker, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. We will, we, we are going to get through this. We definitely are. And I love that your family was your, your first inspiration. They were your first role models. And then your, your parents' friends. 
uh, also. Yeah, I know. I re- literally, like, I remember being, like, 10 years old or something and, you know, I was trying to go to sleep and, like, just heard, like, commotion in our living room. So I, like, peeked around the corner and, like, my two biggest idols were literally sitting on my parents' couch, like, just, like, <laughs> chatting. They were in town from Russia um, on a gymnastics tour and I'm, like, what? <laughs> like, it, so it was like, I, I realized at that moment that that's not normal. Um, or, you know, for a normal gymnast that just like wants to meet their idols one day for their idols to just be like sitting on their couch. But, um, but I'm also like, so fortunate. My dad was actually my coach my entire career. So um, it was really cool to be able to have him kind of just like guide me throughout the entire process. And like, yes, there were moments where it was challenging. But at the same time, at the end of the day, I knew that we had the same goal. You know, we had every single day going into the gym, training seven hours a day. Um, it wasn't always easy, but I knew that, you know, we were on the path together. Well, you had your dad there throughout your entire gymnastics career, though, when it comes to being an entrepreneur and starting something, re- refining yourself, you know, finding your other passion outside of gymnastics, uh, you had to do that all on your own. It, Tell, tell me some maybe early mistakes or maybe some lessons you learned or you learned early on that you wish you would have, you would have known maybe in day one. Yeah. That you could share with well, else. I think so the transition from being an athlete to an entrepreneur is obviously you learn so many things in sports that help you. But I also think that first of all, I'm a perfectionist as I think a lot of people and especially most I'm athletes are. About that. <laughs> and so there were, And I think for me, like if you go into a competition, our sport's very subjective. So, you know, there's a fine line between, it's not always all about the results, obviously, but if you have a mistake, like you fell off the beam, like that's in your own hands, right? So you go back to training and you just try to train harder on that skill or that event or whatever. And you kind of are putting your destiny and your success back in your hands by training harder right and then just going to the next competition and and yes like the judges scores again it's subjective so there's only so much you can do to control but still like somewhat of your destiny is in your control with being an entrepreneur so much is out of your control you know yes there's some stuff in in you know naming the business what's your business and and your company's mission and your employees and, and all of that but Say, for instance, you're, you're going to raise a round of funding. You know, you could go to 10 VCs and every single one is going to say no. And um, I think at the beginning of this, like, me, me transitioning, you know, I would go into meetings sometimes and they were like, love what you're doing, um, you know, but like, it's not the, the right fit or something. And, and at, at the beginning, I would get frustrated, like, with myself and think, like, your idea is bad, or maybe this isn't needed, or, you know, why isn't, why didn't they want, you know, to be part of this or or whatever. So I think kind of understanding that not everything is in your control. And once I was able to kind of let that go a little bit and really stay truly like firm on what my mission, my passion and my goals were, um, that's when things like started moving A, quicker (laughs) um, and B, just like, I mean, who doesn't want to be in control of their destiny, right? Like you never truly want to rely on other people. Um, So, yeah. So I think kind of just starting to realize that not everything in life um, is always in your control. And being an athlete, that was just something that I I learned and and, and that I lived every single day. Um, And and I think going back to, you know, as again, being a gymnast, like that was my passion in, in so whether you're starting your own business or you're part of a startup or um, you're raising a round of funding, you have to be like, you have to like blood, sweat and tears, you know, just like I did training for the Olympics. Like that's how you have to feel every single day, whether you're working in an office, working from home, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you have to like truly be invested in, um, in your goal. What I'm gathering is that your success has changed tremendously or what what your idea of success is as a gymnast to now an entrepreneur. But with that, would you say your definition of success has changed and what would your definition be? Yeah, 100 percent. I think the first moment that I had that I realized 
the change in what success kind of meant um, was four years after I won the Olympic gold medal, I actually tried to make my second Olympic team. And, um, you know, so now I'm going in as the reigning Olympic all around champion. So a, a lot more eyes. No pressure, me, a right? Lot more, <laughs> a lot more expectations, um, a lot more pressure. And on my very best event, um, the Uneven Bars, um, you guys can all YouTube this after, but <laughs> I um, fell off the bar. I landed flat on my face. And I remember laying there on the mat, like just like literally flat, thinking, first of all, what am I doing on the floor? I'm supposed to be on the bar finishing my routine. And then just immediately and very quickly being embarrassed, mortified. Like I just wanted to disappear because I knew, or I thought that I knew, that I had just let so many people down. You know, my coaches, my my family, my teammates, the entire country, like there were 20,000 people in the arena, millions watching back at home. And so as I'm laying there, and I only have 30 seconds to get back up. So this is all happening very fast. Oh, wow. I literally remember thinking, you know, something that my parents always taught me was that no matter what happens, you always have to finish what you started. So knowing that I wasn't going to make that Olympic team, I got back up finished my bar routine, landed on my feet on my dismount. And for the very first time in my entire life and career, I had a standing ovation for the worst routine of my entire life and career. And I so I think in that moment, I, well, not quite in that moment. I remember like, as I'm looking at 20,000 people, I'm like, who else just went and had like the most unbelievable you know beam routine and they're like well on their way to making the olympic team and nobody was going i was the only person um because i was last in that rotation and that's when i kind of realized that for so many years i always thought that we were going to be defined by our success by a gold medal by a placement by making a team by a salary by a job title by how much money you raise and in that moment, I finally realized, like, people are still going to love and support you, even if you fall on your face, literally, like I did, or figuratively. And so oh. I think, like, that was the moment where I just, like, realized the importance of, of truly doing and finding something that you're so passionate about and not necessarily be driven by that, that big, shiny, whether it's a gold medal or, you know, eventually selling your company, whatever, whatever it is that big shiny object is for you, those are important to have, but it's like more important to kind of just keep up there and really on the day-to-day -day focus on, you know, your daily, weekly, monthly goals, your passion, the journey, like all of those things. So, so yes, success really has shifted and changed in my mind. And that's not to say I'm not proud of the moment that I had in 2008 when I won the gold medal like that really truly taught me um you know I was the underdog it was kind of against all odds that I was able to win that gold medal and it, it made me believe like if you have a goal and you work hard anything truly is possible but that's not what defines you as a person Unreal. Thank you for sharing that with us, by the way. Yeah. That, that raw moment. I feel like I was on the mat there with you, just wanting to like pick you up. Um, so, so yeah, thank you. Because I know um, I mean, you're making yourself very vulnerable, but you're also being very raw and very real. So, so thank you. But, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, whether they're people trying to start the funding for a project, they're part of a new startup. I mean, just something where they are just terrified and they feel like they're laying flat on their face on a mat mm -hmm. and don't want to get up. Talk to them for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I um, has really stuck with me ever since I was a little girl, and and I think at the in that moment, obviously when you're when you're young and your parents tell you something, you know, you're just like okay, you know, like you don't really take it all in until like the older you get, the more you realize and it, things like stick with you, right? So one of those things um, my mom taught me when I was very young, and and it was. It was really interesting because a lot of people always ask me, like, did I ever want to quit? You know, did I ever want to just give up and say, like, this is too hard. I just want to be a normal 13 year old girl or six or whatever, be a normal high schooler. Um, and to be honest, yes, I did. There were so many moments that I wanted to give up and I wanted to quit. And it was hard and it was frustrating. And, 
you know, overcoming obstacles such as injuries, um, which like all the obstacles in sport that I had, every single person faces similar obstacles in life. Maybe not like a rolled ankle, you know, but like we all have obstacles in our lives that we have to overcome. And so what my mom, I remember coming home um, and my parents never forced me to do gymnastics. They actually really tried to get me to do something else because they oh. um, were like, oh, I don't know, it's our only child. Like we just want her to be happy. Um, but my happiness just came from the sport like at an early age. And um, so I would come home after you know a bad training, a frustrating training. I was injured, I couldn't get a skill, kept falling off the beam, whatever it was. And I would tell my mom like, I wanna quit. I don't, I don't wanna do this anymore. And she would say, that's totally fine. You can quit, but not today. And she would make me go back to training in the gym the next day, the next day, the next day, until I had one good go. And sometimes that was the very next day. Sometimes it took me a week, sometimes like multiple days, whatever it was. And because obviously like our moms know us very well, I would come home after a good day of training um, and she would know before I even had to tell her and she would say, okay, great. Now you can quit. We'll enroll you back in a public school, find another activity that you want to do. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I never said I wanted to quit. <laughs> so <laughs> the moral of that story was that you can never quit or give up on a bad day. And <laughs> as simple as that sounds, just like saying it, when you actually think about it, it applies to so many things in life, whether it is a sport, whether it's starting your own business, you know, a relationship, family, any single thing in your life, like we're all going to have bad days. It's inevitable to go through life without having one bad day, you know, regardless of the magnitude, whether it's a, like a small issue, a big issue, whatever. And it's, it's just so important to kind of remind yourself that of, and then going back to that, that main initial reason of why you started because you love it and you're passionate about it. And at the end of the day, why would you want to give up or quit on something that you're passionate about. So that was just something that, you know, she taught me when I was little that I just thought it was like only applied to gymnastics when you're young. And then now the older I get, it's it, I, it applies to my everyday life, you know, going through business, um, my personal life, my professional life, like everything. And I just feel, um, I remind myself that a lot because Life and business is, it's not supposed to be easy, right? Like it's not, you don't wake up and you know, every day it's the sun is shining, clearly not here today in Dallas. No <laughs> um, kidding. But, but that's kind of why the importance of having your goals and the passion, it, it, it's all full circle, right? So you have to have that and then not giving up. And, and what gets you through those hard days? Like that's what some people ask me, like, okay, so you can't quit on a bad day, but like what makes, what keeps you motivated? And for me, it was always going back to my goals. So I made vision boards, um, goal sheets, you know, thing, ever since I was a teenager. And, and to this day, I still do, whether it's my personal life, my business, um, you know, all sorts of things. So I think those are the kind of the things that have, you know, helped me um, through so many different chapters of my life. Yeah, I'm curious to know, and it, right now, you know, we're talking about hard times, and I think, take the pandemic, throw it out the window, there's still going to be hard times. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring that pandemic and put it back, because that's what we're dealing with right now. And so, you know, the struggle, I think, has just been amplified just because of the, all the situations that we're in at this moment. And so it might be a little harder to, uh, to, stay, to stay motivated. And so how have you pivoted as an entrepreneur in the, I, by the way, I love the word pivot. I feel like I hear it about 10 times a day, but it's the, it's the most appropriate word. To, how have you pivoted today? But really, how have you pivoted and adapted in this, in this situation and in, in, in this world that we're in right now that we will hopefully be out of soon? But I'm sure you've had to make some changes. And so share, share that with us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's like this, um, this year, 2020 was supposed to probably be one of the busiest years of my career and my life. And it was an Olympic year and, um, so many things on my <laughs> calendar, um, have, mm -hmm. you know, been canceled or postponed. Or, I mean, even this event, I was so excited to, and this was before I moved back to Dallas. So I was so excited to come home and, and, um, be at this event. Obviously we, you make the best of it and now we're here virtually, but, um, I think like that's kind of what I've tried to do is 
like it's it's important to acknowledge like don't just brush things away i think like that's not for me at least that's not necessarily the best way um to handle situations whether they're frustrating disappointing bad um or good right so acknowledge what you're going through and also know like it's okay to feel not okay it's okay to feel upset it's okay to have all the feelings that so many of us are going through right now because none of us have dealt with this ever in our lives you know like to be either working from home or losing a job or you know just not li not living our normal lives um and i think a knowing that we're all kind of going through some of what somewhat of it together um but also just trying and it, it's so hard it's obviously easier said than done but trying to find the best in every situation so for me like my my so i kind of have like two sides i guess of my career and like one side of that is being like nasty luke and the olympic gymnast and the influencer and, and you know that side of my life and then the other side is you know this business um and both sides have kind of been obviously affected and so it's like okay so this is the situation like we already know that let's you know be upset i i always kind of have this rule when something upsets you or you're frustrated or whatever be upset about it for give yourself a time right whether it's that day that night if, if you really need to be upset that week whatever it is but like give yourself a date and like um i love monday mornings because i feel like i just love like starting fresh so maybe it's a monday morning and you're like you know what I'm gonna stop, stop feeling sorry for myself and I'm gonna try to do the very best that I can out of the situation that I've been handed, given, I'm, I'm going through, whatever it is. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, having so much time now, being home, like to be completely honest, I did, I always knew I wanted to end up back in Dallas. I moved back during this pandemic. I bought a home, I got a puppy, like, obviously very personal things, like not necessarily related to business, but it's just trying to figure out exactly how do you take something good out of something that is not great. And I, and I understand like the things I just mentioned, like people are going through a lot worse than the, what I, what I said, but I also think in terms of business, okay. Like for me, a huge part of my business was, was in-person events, you know, summits, live events, um, meetups and, and clinics and, and whatnot. And so obviously we can't do that. So what's the next best thing to that? So it, it takes a lot of strategy. It takes a lot of thinking. It takes, you know, ask, like, ask for help, talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to colleagues, bounce ideas off of each other. And I think that to me has been helpful of don't, oh, yes, feel sorry for yourself for X amount of time, but let's move on, you know, like, try to just like take the best out of it. And so that's, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do more of, of, you know, now trying to plan virtual events because we don't know how long this is going to go on. Um, you know, possibly doing a podcast, like things that I've been wanting to do and haven't had the time to do because this was supposed to be one of the busiest years of my life. And all of a sudden here I am like still at home and, you know, not in Tokyo, um, trying to take advantage of the situation essentially. We need a podcast host. I think Darren might be available. I know. Off. I am yeah. excited to listen to it. I'm over here. I'm taking some notes. I'm like, Nastia says, stop. What was me on Monday mornings? Noted. I, <laughs> stop I feeling sorry for yourself on Monday. I love a good Monday. I don't know why. I don't know if it was because. So Sunday, I trained seven hours a day, six days a week. Sunday was my only day off. And so it was kind of my reset day um, for my body and my mind. And so I think just, um, you know, Monday morning came around and whether I felt rested or not, like I was really great at convincing myself that I was ready to tackle this week. And so I'm like, all right, if I can go train for seven hours a day on a Monday morning at 7 a.m., like I can tackle what's on my to-do list, you know, this Monday morning. <laughs> No, you were admirable. You're admirable. Can, I can't imagine working out for seven hours. Um, little... Me neither anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I've seen your Instagram. I've seen your workouts. You look okay, like you're not seven hours, the stairs there. 
<laughs> not seven hours. <laughs> no, we no, you uh, you're still doing it. And honestly, I thought, man, if I ever tired, I don't know if I ever want to like even break a sweat again. Like I did my part, I'm done so. So so props to you. You know, you have a business. Uh, you obviously we're talking about entrepreneurship here, but do you think that small businesses right now have any advantage because of the current status that we're in? Do you do you see any silver linings? Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I know personally, I've really made it um, an effort to try to support more small businesses um, during this time. And I feel like I've always kind of tried to do that. But I think now more than ever, especially being a small business, um, but given like we're, we're all in a pandemic and, and um, yeah, so I think, you know, having the time and I also think like, the advantage that somebody might have, whether it's like this is your sole focus and you're starting this company or, you know, I know so many people that have full time jobs and they don't necessarily have the time uh, because they're at an office normally at an office every single day. But now they're working from home. And so being able to dedicate a little bit more time to maybe your passion project. Um, so, yeah, I think I honestly think that it's the way you look at it, right? Like. It perspective. perspective. It's all about perspective. I got asked this recently, you know, you always look so positive on social media. And I'm like, well, you don't always necessarily see me like when I'm not on social media, but I do have to say, I think being positive is a choice. And I think that, you know, even especially during these times, every single one of us could be sitting here at home and like, feeling sorry for yourself. And so again, it just goes back to a having perspective and B just trying to see like, okay, this, this is, this, it is what it is. Like now, how do I make the best out of the situation? And that's kind of just what I keep going back to of thinking I have all this time on my hands. Now this is the perfect opportunity to now mm -hmm. grow this business and grow this brand and um, do something that I normally wouldn't have time to do if this was just any other year. You know, you say that and I'm like, I'm going to get this done. I haven't gotten a whole lot done quite yet. I'm still working on. I'm I had working. like this big goal of, you know, reading however many books. Can't say that I've read too many. <laughs> <laughs> but look at you you're still I mean, you're still busy you're still doing things but i know i know you'll get to that list eventually hey you know earlier you mentioned a vision board you said you've always had one even in your younger years and even now as a businesswoman um what's on your vision board do you mind sharing that with me Is that your personal yeah. yeah well quick backstory on that so the first time i had a vision board um was in 2008 i read the book the secret so if you guys have whoever's listening here if you guys have not read it i highly recommend it um it's it's not going to give like too much away but just about like the law of attraction and like truly positive thinking and it, so anyways in this book it you know tells you to create this vision board and um i right around the time that i read it, it was a few months before the olympics and the um the beijing olympic committee had just released what the olympic medals were going to look like and so as i'm reading this book and it's telling me to do this vision board and i'm like you know obviously a few months before the olympics that's all i'm thinking about even though i'm saying like oh no the olympics are in the back of my mind like let's be real that's the only thing i was really thinking about um your honesty. so awesome. I, I printed off um the gold silver and bronze medals and i put them on my vision board um a few other things like motivational or inspirational quotes. Uh, this little girl, um, and I'm still determined to find her. So if you're watching, um, it was a little piece of fan mail that this little girl had written me. And she also um, drew a little picture with, with crayons and it was like stick figures. And it was, it, I, I'm assuming her mom or sister, someone helped write at the bottom, like 2008 Olympic games. Um, and it was the podium and it was like first, second, and third. And there was a little stick figure gymnast with like this blonde ponytail <laughs> and a pink leotard and a pink scrunchie. Now, like nobody knew what color leotard I was going to be wearing. Um, and she just wrote like an arrow to the girl that was in first place. And she said, it said you. So I, to this day, have it saved um, because I thought like, put that next to, um, it's in my office. I it put that next to, the picture of, you know, the Olympic medals that I had just seen and found on the internet. Um, 
And then some personal stuff, like travel stuff. Like I had never been to Paris and I'd always wanted to go to Paris. So like, it doesn't necessarily all have to be about your business. It can be about like your personal life. But um, I, so I, I printed those out and made this board. You know, I was like 17 or 18 at the time. So like made it cute. <laughs> um, and my mom actually saw it um, when she was in my room one day. And my dad has four Olympic medals and we, I think I had probably seen them at one point in my life, but I never, they're never like displayed or hung anywhere in our house. And my mom, I think they were like, actually, which is really sad at the time, they were like just in a box in the basement. And so my mom got my, one of my dad's Olympic gold medals and she hung it on my board. So I came home from practice one day and I saw like the photo, like this picture that I printed off on my like printer um, of a gold medal that was like the exact design that you know for the olympics happening in a few months right next to excuse me right next to my dad's real olympic gold medal and just kind of like seeing the side by side of like this is what you're trying to achieve and even though this isn't your medal like it just felt so real like in that moment i was like wow okay like i can do this this is attainable like so I know like not everybody's gonna have an Olympic gold medal um, on their vision board, but uh, that to me was just something like, and then obviously when it happened, um, I totally believed in vision boards and the law of attraction and, and all of that. And so, yeah, so moving on, I guess like I have always kind of made it a thing that I love doing it with either family or friends or whatever. Um, right around New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve, right before the beginning of the new year, just kind of like pulling out that vision board, whether it's updating it or kind of like, you know, seeing if you have new goals or, you know, things that you've achieved or like what you did in that year. Um, so for this year, it was actually going into this year, it was really interesting. Like I had, you know, wanted to move back to Texas at some point in my life and then um, wanted to buy a house. Like, a lot of personal stuff and then obviously a lot of business stuff and in a lot of the business stuff was i had kind of kept pushing back on this rebrand of muse um and um one of my mentors kept really just pushing me like the last probably the last year and a half of you know you, you should do this if not if not now when and um yeah so i, I was finally like able to do that a lot more um business stuff i guess on that vision board um some very specific but really i think at the end of the day um for me it's it's been about you know that that core mission of trying to inspire this next generation so so the current goal i guess is to try to help this next generation in any way possible whether they are athletes whether they're entrepreneurs whether they want to be a lawyer a doctor and, and i'm not saying that I obviously know anything about being a lawyer or a doctor, but I think the path and the journey and, and similar to what Darren was talking about, like, I don't know much about football besides just being a fan watching on the couch, but I know, um, you know, we all, we're all on similar paths and journeys of wanting to achieve our personal goals and, and the obstacles that you have to get through to get to, get to you know, that end goal. I want to give a little PSA really quick, you guys. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, I think I'm going to ask you another question, Nastia, and then we're going to open it up to the floor for some Q&A. So if you guys want to start um, writing it there in the chat there on the side, start sending them through. Uh, I think I'm going to have some help here, hopefully, with those Q&As. Uh, but I wanted to say really quick, so The Secret, the first time I heard about the book, I just interviewed the cast of the movie that just came out. It's The Secret oh. Dream. Yeah, so if you're like, haven't heard it, or I haven't read the book, you the book have movie. to read it. Oh my yeah, gosh. Thank you. But also watch the movie because it's a really I movie. yeah. So I read the book quick quick backstory. When I read the book, um, yeah, I follow them on social media and Ron Deburn, the, the author actually DM'd me like a week and a half ago. And I have met like so many like I've been very lucky to have met so many incredible athletes, like entrepreneurs, just fascinating people throughout my life, I guess. And when she DM'd me, like I had a fangirl moment. Um, <laughs> she gave me like early access to this movie and I was like, stop what you're doing. Go watch the movie now. Like it was oh. really cool. And we've gone back and forth a few times. So, uh, and then I shared my story with her with, with the Olympics. So it was, 
it was pretty special. So yeah, I highly recommend this book. That's amazing. Not also like being an influencer, like not an ad, not not anything, just truly something that like I have loved and that has helped me. What's your discount code, Nastia? Yeah. <laughs> Swipe up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but if she has a good deal, definitely take advantage Dang. of that for sure. I don't know the deal, but actually just read the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, so fun. you're so fun to talk about. And thank you for sharing your vision board. I, I want to, I hope, I'm sure you have though, taken a picture of the hand drawn picture and put it on social to see if maybe anybody can help you find. That's a, a really bit. good idea. I haven't, I know. I'm like, I really want to find this little girl. I mean, now she's obviously not little anymore, you know? Um, this, is this is 2008. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, she's a full grown lady now. We got to find her. Maybe she remembers. We got to see what Ugh. she's up to. I know. I wish she like wrote her name on it, but so well, wherever no, you are, like I will forever keep this little drawing with crayons. <laughs> so, so sweet. Yeah. Well, I really hope. And, and I think that'd also be a great story on Good Morning Texas. So I'd love to hear I'd, the full <laughs> circle there. The that'd full circle. Great. Yes. Absolutely. Hey, you know, to kind of wrap things up, at least before we get to Q&A, would you like to leave us with any final thoughts? I mean, just really empathize for those who are watching right now. They might be hitting some roadblocks. They might be feeling uh, the way you did on the mat in 2000 and in, what was it, 12? 12, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Quick math, quick math. All the, all the Olympics kind of run together after, after Which so many. Um, yeah, maybe just some words of encouragement if, if they're feeling kind of uh, discouraged. Yeah, you know, I think that moment that I had in 2012, um, and I know I kind of already said this, but that, that truly became the defining moment of my career. And I feel like sometimes when I say that, people are like, oh, come on, like you have an Olympic gold medal. So... A, it's easy for you to say that a defining moment was you falling on your face when you still have that. But that's, again, not what we're defined by. And I think mm -hmm. that that is so important to remember. Like, you're, you as a human being are never going to be defined by your job, the success of your job, the amount of money that you make, um, a gold medal that you win or don't win, uh, you know, performance that you stick the landing or fall on your face. Like none of those things will ever define you, nor will any of those things go with you when we're gone. And I think like that is something I know, like I have to remind myself sometimes. And I know like we don't always sit here, you know, every day and remind ourselves that, but I think especially when you're going through a tough time and I know so many are during this pandemic, um, whether it is personally or professionally. Um, I think it's so important to uh, remind yourself of that. Remind yourself that, you know, at the end of the day, find something that you're passionate about. Um, enjoy that journey, the struggles, the obstacles, the quote unquote failures, um, but, but truly love what you do and, and only start especially a startup, a business, whatever, if like you truly like live and breathe it and have such a passion for it because it is going to become, you know, your everything and like your child, your puppy, your husband, like it is going to become, feel like it becomes like a little bit of every single part of your life. And so it is just so important. I think gymnastics kind of taught me that of even on the bad days, like I want, I'd always go back and think, I don't want to have any regrets. And I think to me, that was 2012. Like so many people ask me like, why, why wouldn't you just end on a high note? You won the Olympic all around gold medal. Why, like there's, what else is there for you to achieve and do? And for me, I knew that I was going to be at that next Olympics thinking, you know, whether I was working, competing on the floor with my teammates, and I didn't want to be in the stands thinking, what if? What if I would have tried? What if I just would have given it my all one last time? And, and whether or not I made that Olympic team, and obviously I didn't, but whether what, if I did or didn't, I didn't want to be sitting here today in 2020 thinking, what if I would have tried to make that Olympic team eight years ago? How different would my life possibly be or, or maybe not be? You know, we don't, we don't know. But I think for all of the people out there going back and forth on if they should or shouldn't, you know, start, um, go after their passion, start that company, start that dream, go towards that goal. Um, 
I encourage you to do so because you just, you living for me, living my life, the biggest fear I think in my life has not been failure. It has been having regret and living with regret. And so I constantly make that an effort to not live my life thinking what if. Um, so yeah, so I think like that would probably be my biggest piece of advice. You know, never quit on a bad day, always finish what you've started um, and don't live your life in fear or, or regret. I feel like on that one, Austin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is, a, that is a great way. You're leaving us on a very uplifting note. Yeah. Yeah. The Great storms luck. have calmed down, at least where I am, so maybe. I, I think so here. I mean, I think it sounds okay. The We've lights been, are still on, so that's a good on. news. We have not been electrocuted all, all well here. Um, do you got to get us a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm having trouble finding them, so. I, I'm here to assist. Uh, teamwork, you know. Thank you. Um, this is actually a really nice segue into um, tomorrow is a big day for Dallas Startup Week, which is Women of Innovation. And actually, at 2 o'clock tomorrow, speaking on vision boards, there's a vision board workshop. So Ooh, I might want to join that. <laughs> I thought it was, I think it's brilliant. It was covering all the key points you're talking about, staying focused, um, kind of thinking of that law of attraction, putting up the actual images. Um, but there's actually an expert who's guiding it. So you should probably tune in tomorrow at 2 o'clock, um, which I'm sure you can sign in through, through hop in here. Mm -hmm. And we've got a great question um, around advice for women in business, especially young women who are entering the workforce or entering the business world, um, whether that be from school or from a transition from another career. Um, any advice for young women specifically entering the workforce? Yeah, first of all, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Um, and don't let anybody put you in a box. Um, one of my biggest mentors um, shared that with me probably a year or two ago. Um, and, you know, he kind of said, let, let me guess, like you go into a meeting or a room or whatever. And, and I'm sure more than once people are like, oh, you're the gymnast. Like, I remember the pink leotard, the matching pink scrunchie, you want a gold medal. And it's like, <laughs> again, yes, that was me. <laughs> like, not going to deny scrunchie it. Scrunchie is the best part about this. <laughs> <laughs> which also like scrunchie, not to get on a fashion note, but scrunchies are back in, which was not like cool yeah, back when I was sure. Yeah. But I just remember, and, and so anyway, so he told me that, like, let me guess, like people say that, or you feel like people think that. And I was like, yeah, a hundred percent. And he was like, don't, don't let people make you feel that way. You know, like you're putting yourself in this box, whether people actually say that or not, like you're doing this a little bit to yourself. And so don't have boundaries, right? Like, don't let anybody tell you that all you know how to do is you know, a backhand spin layout layout on the balance beam. Like you are so much more than your past. You are so much more than the things that you've already accomplished and achieved. And you're constantly evolving. You're constantly learning. So, you know, that advice obviously goes for, for both men and women. Um, but I think as, as a female, sometimes I think we do tend to put ourselves a little bit more in these imaginary boxes, you know, whether it's, you're not sure if, or, or you're intimidated by the, a certain industry being, you know, more male dominant or um, whatever your fear is, right? So I think just trying to remove those fears and truly reminding yourself that A, you're not defined by anything, especially a gender, um, and B, just nev never put yourself in that box because I've done that for years. And as soon as he told me that, um, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's so true. Like, break those walls down those barriers you know it's like you you can do you can you're able to do something that others have done or or are also trying to do and, and just because you are a gymnast and a pink patriot like means nothing you know it doesn't mean anything so kind of like don't let other people convince you otherwise basically if you if you have that dream and that goal like stick stick to your vision absolutely yeah, I love what you said earlier. Uh, and it, I'm going a few minutes back. You mentioned something like one day when we're gone, we're not going to have this. And that's something that I think about often, you know, about uh, maybe it's I call it earthly things or desires or things like that. And sometimes I have to stop and think like, OK, is this really going to matter one day whenever I'm not here? Right. No. 
Yeah, yeah, somebody once told me, Alana, do you think someone's going to go up? And, and I don't mean to get a little uh, dark here, but it's in, in a light way, if that even makes sense. Someone yeah. says, do you think someone's going to stand up at your eulogy and say, they had, she had a really great pink couch. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, so okay. true, though. I know. It's, I don't it's, have a pink couch, but it's. I think I it's was going to say, like, that sounds really fun. Oh, why? Why not? Have a, I know a few people have a pink couch. I don't, but 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 the the moral of it, yes, absolutely. Stories, you know, which is prioritizing and perspective also. Right. right. Uh, it, on that, uh, Diana has a Diana Decker. She's come through with some really great questions talking about values here. She says, "What specific values do you hold important to your business and your team?" Good question. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I've been so lucky that, so as I kind of mentioned, I kind of have like these two parts of my life and career, I guess you could say. And, you know, the one side being an Olympian, an influencer, commentator, like all of that. And um, the, the lines definitely cross a lot. But what, what I'm kind of going at is my team on like the team and the nasty looking kind of side. I am so, so, so lucky to have the most incredible team in hardworking, down to earth um, women that I get to work with every single day and um, kind of seeing their business and, and um, their company continue to become more and more successful and the way that they work and that the values and core, core values and beliefs that they stick to have, have kind of like inspired me to obviously do the same and really take a step back and kind of think like, what are your values? What are your core values? What's important to you? Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel like I've been able to do that fairly well. I think everybody can always improve on certain things in life and, and really everything. But um, from from a brand perspective, um, you know, we truly only work with brands that like that we love and that we're passionate about and that or products that we use and and making sure that you stick to like the truth of who you are. And so I think that it translates very easily into then your own business and your own team, right? So having your own employees when you are like part of something um, is even more important um, or maybe even just as important, I guess you could say. But I think, you know, figuring out like, so my manager, Britt, like we, we joke about this or not really joke because it's like so true, but we are so adamant about, you know, if, if something has to be delivered, um, whether it's a piece of content or, you know, um, whatever it is, like we are always multiple days early. We're on, like, if you're late or sorry, if you're on time, you're late, you know, so we're always early. We're constantly, and it's like, that has just become a part of like, this side of me this brand and so that's what's important to me has become important to me for my business as well you know i want to be able to work with people that and i'm not being like crazy you have to be like 20 minutes early or you're late but i think that the importance of things that are like important to me as an athlete we weren't allowed to be late right and so i think that it kind of goes back to that your time and everybody's time is valuable so like don't waste time and that's just like one example i guess you could say but i think trying to figure out what's important to you personally um and then also knowing that like you want the people that you work with and and sometimes that's out of your control but if you are starting a business and you're hiring employees jot down three to five things that are extremely important for you personally, because you're going to be, you know, growing with these people, your employees and in your business essentially. And there are going to be challenges. There are going to be roadblocks in the way. So even despite any kind of roadblock that you have, you always have to know that your core values are going to always align. If you start, you know, at, at, at the very bare minimum, when you, when you hire someone or when, when you start a team, whatever, you're always going to have those core values, no matter what obstacle kind of gets in the way. I think it's a great foundation to always be able to round back around, to, to come back to, to come back to if you start getting astray, maybe off brand or anything, anything like that. I want to just comment really quick. Uh, Raquel Henry, she says, thank you for sharing the story. We're giving you a standing ovation today. Oh, I, I thought when it popped sweet. up. Yeah, so that, sweet. Was, that was really sweet. 
So sweet. Um, I think the big thing that I take from that is all about intention. Um, even participating in something like this, it's really easy to want to turn it on in the background and not be focused on it. But there are so many fun engagement opportunities. Networking has been the weirdest thing in 2020. So using events like this, listening to great speakers, um, and being intentional about your purpose and involvement in Dallas Startup Week. And so thank you to everybody who's tuned in and who's been active um, here with Asia and previously with Darren. That's, that's a big deal. I don't know if we have maybe one more question or, you know what, I have a question for you because this is something that I think a lot of people are yeah. curious about. Um, what are you paying attention to? What are you reading? What podcasts are you listening to other than starting growing with Darren maybe? Um, <laughs> what, uh, where, do you, where do you go for um, other than the secret? Uh, yeah. What content are you consuming that keeps you energized and on top of trends and creative in that way. Um, what are some things people can, can look for right away? Well, one of my favorite um, podcasts, and I have been listening to this one for, I feel like, years. And um, obviously, you know, they have new episodes all the time. But How I Built This um, is just one of my favorite podcasts because I feel like, first of all, like there, there's so many brands or businesses that like, you, 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 every single person, whether uses or has been to or consumed or whatever. So it's relatable in the sense of like, oh yeah, I went to Chipotle like last week, whatever, you know, whatever the brand or the business is. Um, and then I think the other thing, the reason why I love it so much, um, and I feel like it's, it's kind of relatable in the sense of, you know, being that athlete, that gymnast from 2008, where millions of people only saw that fairy tale moment that I had in Beijing that night where, you know, I had four incredible routines and won that gold medal, but nobody saw the blood, sweat, and tears. Nobody saw, you know, me literally never really even talked about this, but I literally almost quit one month before the Olympic trials because it was just so hard, so much pressure, so much, so many expectations. And I just like, almost hit my limit. And, you know, obviously looking back at it now, like, I'm so glad that I didn't, but I think basically the reason that I love that podcast is it talks about those struggles so much. It talks about your quote unquote failures. And I think in this world that we live in, and I, and I think and in, in hope that it is getting better and it's getting more normal to talk about this, but I think in the world of social media that we all live on, we all want to portray that we have this picture perfect life, right? And that every single thing on social media is great and it's everything's perfect and, and probably the same for your business. So that's why I, I just feel like if you're able to share your struggles and the failures with each other and maybe new business owners or someone that's looking to start their own company but they're scared um, of failure. Uh, and so for, for somebody to listen to so many of these successful companies and, and their founders or CEOs or, or whatever that have also been through every single one had this consistent theme of, and this is when it almost like didn't happen. You know, we were down to one penny left in our, you know, savings account. And then all of a sudden, Bloomingdale's bought, you know, one shipment of, you know, case they purchased or something. And, um, and then that's when it became the brand or something. So um, that to me, like, I, I just love, and I guess it sounds weird. Like, I don't love, like, listening to, like, failure moments. But I think, like, that's what makes, you know, the success that much more worth it when you when you are able to overcome a failure or a struggle or you know just a roadblock and and also knowing that you're not alone like no job no company no nothing is is easy it's it's the same things that you know i've been kind of talking about this this last hour of you're gonna have bad days so how do you get through those and so i think listening again just listening to other people talk about it when it's not necessarily you your family telling you like you can do this you know it's hearing it from others um has has kind of helped me nasty listen i'm really glad the lights came back and i'm glad that we could have this conversation with you and i thought <laughs> bless her she has to do this i know herself. i was like okay you know what but she um, could do it she could bounce back you 
always have to be prepared. I was ready to go, and it would have been you great. Were. But this was this was more this was better. I had no doubt that you could do it. <laughs> but if I were to choose, I would definitely want it. And it just the same way we're here together. Like there's somebody to kind of bounce back, and then yeah. it was a pleasure being that person with you and alongside you today. Also, ah, it was, this good, to, it was good to connect with everybody. Thank you so much, to everybody, for tuning in. Nasi, before we before we hang up here, can you tell everyone how to find you? Um, tell us where to find your page where to look out and connect with you in the future. Yes, um, so my social is um, all the same, at Nasty Lucan, my um, blog is nastylucan.com, so like that side of things. And then um, uh, my, my company, The Muse Collective, so it's at The Muse Collective. So we'll be doing a lot more um, in the near future and, and hopefully um, some virtual events coming up soon, podcasts, like a lot of really fun things in the works. So make sure you follow along and yeah. <laughs> Um, keep Good Morning Texas in mind, okay? We'd love to. I, I'm it. like, I'm right around the corner now. So now being back <laughs> home, it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> Come on down and hang out. Keep the mask on. Wash keep your hands. <laughs> All right. Thank good you so much it. for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. And, and like, like we've said, thank you for being vulnerable. I think um, going back to how I built this, it's not called how I failed and gave up. It's about the journey along the way. And so hearing those little hiccups and it maybe not, it isn't, I think what I hope people gather from what you've, what you've said, you've obviously um, lived a really fantastic but unique life. Not everyone here is a gymnast, but they all have their own struggles. They all have their own uneven bars and pushing through that no matter what that struggle is. I've learned a lot from how I built this, um, but really about overcoming those struggles. And from what I understand, and maybe you'll agree, is it's not really about introducing some sort of groundbreaking concept. A lot of the things they do are simple fixes or simple mindset pushes. Um, they don't need to be an expert in anything. It's just all about a simple approach. And I think that's what a lot of people here too been to see. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much. Hope to see you, you in person one day. Soon one day. If you need to get studio, we've got a we've got a great setup here. If you if you ever want to come film, you have to let us know. Um, and great in seeing today. Thank you guys. Wonderful uh, job, Thank you so much. Our roles were reversed today, which I, I kind of like, but I like being close to distance, but close. Um, <laughs> thank thank you, you so much again to everybody for tuning in mm -hmm. to the Dallas Startup Week keynote address. There's still a couple of days of good things going on tomorrow. Like I mentioned, Women of Innovation. So get your vision boards ready. And I will encourage the guys to tune in too. We've got some really incredible powerhouses who are telling us more about how they started their business and what their goals are in the future. So I encourage everyone to tune in and listen. And then last but not least, the state of entrepreneurship is coming up. So tune in. The schedule is live here on the page. Um, we hope to see you there. And thank you so much for tuning in. And a very special thank you. To our team behind this giant computer back here, Ryan and Christopher, thank you so much for helping us through a actual, not a tornado, lightning storm, Something. surge. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Chris. Y'all are great. Thank you. And thank you to the Deck and Capital Factory for um, joining us uh, earlier this, uh, this evening. So thank you so much, everyone. We hope to see you later. Bye.